Hello, it's Scott Manley here. As many of you may have heard, I am no longer in my 40s. Yesterday, I just hit the big 5-0. And to reflect on that, I have a story I want to tell about the lifetime of, well, technological devices. Electronics, I guess, is the obvious one. You know, sure, we're all used to various, uh, you know, phone manufacturers launching their new phones every year, hoping everyone will upgrade. And, you know, honestly, uh, you know, if you've got an iPhone, they support them going way back. Like this is a, an iPhone uh, 6S and it still works. It's got a, it still gets OS updates. My headphones, they're 20 years old, right? My turntables downstairs, 20 years old. I have friends who have 40 year old airplanes. You know, useful life depends upon the subject. Now, I have found a technological device which has an operating lifetime measured in microseconds, right? This is a complex device which is doing like sensor readouts, it's uh, processing them, it's transmitting them, and it lives for a vanishingly small amount of time on human timescales. This is basically a telemetry module which is used to measure the performance of an explosive system in a nuclear weapon, specifically a nuclear weapon test device which has been thrown across you know the the pacific to a target site and as it begins its pre-planned you know detonation sequence there is a device in there that is measuring how these explosives are triggering to make sure that if that was a live warhead that would have actually made the big bada boom that it was supposed to so yeah I've talked about nuclear stockpile testing uh, recently, actually, in my video about the National Ignition Facility achieving ignition. And, you know, this is this is a big deal for the US. You know, the US hasn't detonated a nuclear weapon since 1992. That's 30 years during which they haven't been able to test anything. So they don't know whether the devices will work for sure, but they are pretty sure because they do all sorts of research and testing to make sure that every single part functions as it expects. There's this huge document that I you know, found which uh, dates from the 1990s, but it talks about all the different programs they have implemented for their nuclear stockpile stewardship. Things like, you know, things that we would not normally consider, let's say in regular terms, right? They are looking for hydrogen, sorry, helium bubbles that form inside plutonium pits and cause them to swell because plutonium decays via alpha particles and the alpha particles are helium. So those particles collect in little bubbles, high pressure bubbles that cause the uh, pits to expand and that might change how it gets imploded. You have to consider the aging of polymers that are used in various substances. There's a explosives which can creep and change chemically over time, which might affect their detonation. Uh, lubricants which can become sticky. So obviously there's a lot of secrecy surrounding all these. So despite us having this you know, great documents explaining all the stuff surrounding the device, we still don't have any details about exactly what the dimensions of it are, are or whatever. So yeah, that's that's kind of the way they work. Like uh, there's a famous story of the forbidden spheres at Los Alamos. That is during development of, you know, Manhattan Project, you have scientists working on the device and you have security people who are tasked with making sure that nothing can leak out, right? And so they're told, they can't be told exactly how the device works. So they have to try to figure out what might be critically important. And they're told that measurements of working parts are a critical thing. And one of the working parts, of course, in a nuclear warhead is the spherical pit. And so they begin to look around the office and they find things like ashtrays, which are spherical. Now, is that an ashtray or is it potentially a model of a pit? They don't know. They can't be told. It's classified. And so apparently at one point, they succeeded in getting any spheres in these offices declared potentially you know, secret. Therefore, if you had anything spherical, you couldn't leave out on your desk where anyone could come by and see it. You had to put it in your safe. And that apparently culminated in one employee getting chastised for leaving an orange on his desk as part of his lunch. He was supposed to put the orange in a safe because it's a sphere and you never know what you could learn about nuclear weapons from measuring that orange. Anyway, yes, quick aside because, you know, tangents, we love them.
So yeah, uh, I want to talk about the device that I'm specifically talking about is a project called High Explosive um, Radio Telemetry, right? So what they have, what they developed was uh, little fiber optic sensors because the, the idea is you would embed these inside the explosive. So at the tip of this little fiber optic, you would have a little bit of, uh, was it lutetium oxyorthosilicate, which is a type of crystal which is used for like uh, gamma ray scintillators and stuff. And it has a property called tribal luminescence. That means that as it's crushed, it generates little flashes of light. So you put the, that on the tip and then you cover the tip in gold so that no light can leak in. And then when the explosive shock wave hits it, it crushes it, generates a flash of light which shoots down the fiber optic to a sensor uh, which can then read out exactly when this the you know explosive front hits there. So that's great. It gives you actual telemetry from inside the block of explosives. Now, the thing is, um, like these explosives, the, the shockwave moves at a rate of about eight kilometers per second. So on the timescales we're talking about, it's more like eight millimeters per microsecond. So that uh, is important, you know, you've got shockwave moving very quickly, but you can get the data out of it before the shockwave actually hits the sensors. The thing is, in a nuclear weapon, you want your explosive shockwave to be a sphere going inwards. So you cannot have the sensor being read from the outside because the explosion destroys the fiber optic and you can't see when the other end is hit. So you have the fiber optic on the inside leading to a readout or a sensor on the interior of this sphere watching as this implosion comes in towards it. You know, the we don't exactly know how the US initiates a perfect spherical detonation implosion wave. We know how it worked with like the Fat Man where it uses, you know, these explosive lenses. It's known that it's possible to do a two-point explosive lens. That's one potential option. Um, it's also possible to use like a multi-point initiator tile where you have lots of really small explosive lenses or there's like flying plate initiators. All of these things are fascinating in their own way, but most importantly, they're all supposed to deliver a perfect spherical uh, detonation going inwards, right? So if you are going to read this out, you have to have your sensors inside this imploding sphere. And the idea is that you have a bunch of these sensors around the interior reading, leading to a device inside the center, which is then processing this and sending the data out via radio telemetry so that they can figure out whether the implosion was perfectly spherical. This thing clearly has a very limited lifespan before it gets crushed. As I said, eight millimeters per microsecond. So you can imagine that it doesn't last very long before this hits the middle. So there are actually some details about their test devices, not the final devices. Um, and this was like 1998, so they needed really high performance. They had a float, uh, an FPGA, right, which is basically how you implement custom hardware that runs very quickly. It ran at about 100 megahertz, and it basically had circuitry for like 64 different timers connected to their own uh, fiber optic readouts. Um, each of these would have an address for the which fiber optic was being referred to, and then it would have a 14-bit timer running at 100 megahertz. So that's one tick every 10 nanoseconds. Uh, the good news, by the way, for programmers about there is that you know 14-bit integer counter. You know, I know you would normally be worried about integer overflow, but this device doesn't live long enough for integer overflow to actually happen. So. As these things, what happens is the very first one of these that triggers immediately starts all the timers from zero, and then that one gets read out, and then all the others are read out relative to this first event. And so they get squirted into like a little, you know, buffer, which as, you know, as the things arrive, they get transmitted out. And the, the data format is like a, you know, 14-bit timer, a 6-bit address, and a 4-bit uh, checksum that gets sent out. So the transmitter is running at 2.23 gigahertz and using the encoding system they get about 100 megabits per second out. So they can send out four of these every microsecond. It takes 16 microseconds to send all 64 and in that time your 8 kilometer per second detonation right has moved about 
13 centimeters or about five inches. So again, you've got to imagine this thing moving in at a comically slow speed while this thing is operating furiously in the heart of this, sending out the data. Now, as, as the stuff comes in, it may not maybe find that it has cycles where there's no new data. Well, it's also set up that it will start replaying old data when there's no uh, new data coming in. So after all the data has come in, it is spending its time furiously sending out and replaying the data multiple times before it finally gets crushed at the very end. So uh, yeah, it, it's this kind of wild thing. Now, there are images showing these warheads coming into like Kwajalein Atoll, where this is what happens. They, they launch them from Vandenberg, fly across the Pacific, and then they come in and they detonate. Now, <laughs> The thing is, these things are moving at kilometers per second. So when they detonate in an explosion, the explosion actually forms a cone. But if you think about it, this thing lasts, you know, less than 160 microseconds. So in the time that this thing takes to start up, transmit its stuff and finally die, the warhead probably moves about that far, <laughs> right? It's absolutely ridiculous, but this is, the wild things that nuclear technology designers have come up with to verify an actual warhead which has been placed on top of a rocket, flown for a thousand, hit re-entry and is going to detonate at the last minute. And they can get actual telemetry out of their explosive systems in this way. Yeah, so like if you look, if you're, if you're say like working on a, a device and you can put it in a lab and test it, they actually have, you know, uh, computer-aided tomography systems which illuminate it with x-rays from multiple angles and they can reconstruct the implosion in 3D using x-rays. But it's it's worth talking about the original way in which they figured out the implosion uh, for, you know, development of the fat man. This was called the, the RALA experiment, that is for radioactive lathanum. They would use a, an isotope of lanthanum which had a half-life of 40 hours and emitted a lot of gamma rays. So they would put this inside a sphere which wasn't you know, a fissile material, it would be something like copper or iron, and it would be emitting gamma rays which would penetrate through this and could be received on the outside. Now as the implosion started, it would squeeze the thing down, and as it squeezes it down, the density of the material gets higher and it blocks more of the gamma rays. So the gamma ray detectors would see the gamma ray drop off. And if you had multiple detectors at multiple angles, they, you would expect them all to have exactly the same drop off over time. Otherwise your implosion was not spherical. They would do hundreds of these tests and every time they did it, they would spread radioactive material over this particular you know, canyon. They used lanthanum because it would decay very quickly to something that was safe, but even then there were impurities that sort of still linger in that environment years later. And the Forestry Service, I think, they wanted to like do some tree thinning in that area and they were told, yeah, you should just probably fence that off because we now know that there are sort of scary isotopes still left living around. Anyway, I assure you that yes, while I am uh, just hit you know 50, I have a lot more life left in me and I hope to continue to uh, share some cool stories with you and I hope you love this one. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.